My first experience of death was pretty confronting actually. I was a student nurse in the south of New Zealand and I got asked to go to ICU to lay out a body who, of a man who just died. So I'd never seen a dead person before and all of a sudden I was involved in you know, providing that after death care. And I found that confronting because I had no idea who he was, what his story was. And that was in contrast to lots of experiences that came after that, where the sort of sacredness of being with somebody at the end of their life was all bound up in knowing their story and being able to provide support to family and, and to them personally. And so, yeah, quite contrasting memories of death. The most profound memory for me of where I changed my perception about end of life care was looking after the chief pathologist at the Kew Hospital in Invercargill. And he obviously, because he'd been a colleague in the hospital, everybody rallied around what was happening for him. And he ended up dying in hospital. And over the several weeks of his last hospitalisation, a group of us took really 24 hour care of him with very individualised approach. We got taught to do a whole lot of things such as insert intravenous cannulas that had not been done before by nurses in that context and developed a really close working relationship with the medical staff who were looking after him. And it, it showed to me what you can do if you have a team of people really building an end of life experience centred on the needs of that particular individual. And it really framed how I wanted to provide end of life care as my career developed. One of the first guiding principles is normalisation of death and dying. And to try and help patients and their families to really come to understand that this can be a growth experience, not necessarily a negative experience. And I've been involved in programs like Death Over Dinner and um, trying to change public conversations. And I've done that within my own family for when my, when my brother was dying and helping his wife and children and him really shape his last months of life. And then again for my niece about five years ago where she was going in for a major operation that she might not have survived. And I sat down with her and her parents and we planned all the things that she would want to happen if she didn't survive the operation. And it really created a whole different conversation within her family. One of the things we did was set up a Facebook group with all her friends so that they could travel through that journey with her. And her normalisation of her own dying Many of those friends have articulated after that about how that changed their understanding of what was possible at the end of life and that it didn't need to be a morbid experience that you could create many positive memories for all the people that you love. My niece Terry uh, was only 47 when she was diagnosed with a, a, an adrenal cancer and she was a psychiatric nurse and so she had a particular attitude to life that was quite out there and um, confronting. And she and her mother were heading into the hospital visit and she has Casey Chambers on the radio singing, we're all gonna die one day. And that became kind of her mantra of what it was like to be facing death, but to choose an attitude that said, this is gonna be a positive experience for me if it can be and for also her family and friends. So planning her funeral was really important to her. We had chess games on the lawn. We had a friend singing Casey Chambers songs in the background. She had kids drawing all over her coffin and all of that had been planned down as to say, I'm not gonna lose me just because you are losing me. I think there's huge variability in the extent to which doctors and nurses feel comfortable about talking about death and dying and helping people make decisions that are wise at the end of their life. So I've certainly seen doctors and nurses unable to kind of be even in a, in a room with somebody and the sort of 
sense that they're not, not supporting people's decisions, but I've seen the other happen as well. When, when my niece was unwell, she uh, had to make some pretty profound decisions on a Friday. Her medical oncologist was about to fly out to the US. He made a phone call, a couple of other people who'd never met my niece came into the room, did the assessment, and then in, in an incredibly skilled way, managed to help her make a decision not to have more treatment. And so when you see it done beautifully, you absolutely know that it's there. And so I'm hoping that that's reflective of a major sh shift towards better communication, better engagement with patients about the decisions that they need to make and hopefully therefore better end of life outcomes. The inevitability of death is something that many health professionals struggle with, but I think it's particularly difficult for doctors. Doctors are really focused on trying to save lives and so they, they invest as much in getting well as the person who they're treating does. Uh, if you follow someone like Mark Lewis on Twitter, who's a doctor who's had pancreatic cancer, you know, he, he talks a lot about the people that he's saved. But it's really important to be able to also have the conversations where you say you're going to hope for the best, but you're also going to plan for the worst. One of the things that can happen if you're so focused on survival is that people think they've let you down when the inevitable happens and, and they are going to die. So being open to having both sides of those conversations is really important as health professionals. So I think the experience does differ between doctors and nurses. There are obviously some similarities, but one of the things that happens for nurses is they're there in the, the moments of, I think, quiet contemplation that patients have. The, the patients are more likely to say to the nurse that they think that the, there might not be much point in having more treatment before they'll say it to the doctor, often because they don't want to let the doctor down. Um, they do feel like they're failing you when they want to stop treatment. And so I, I think nurses often come to grips with where the person is. The patients don't tidy themselves up. I remember when I was working in community palliative care, the patients would get themselves all ready when they were seeing the doctor. But the nurse came into the home and just experienced the patient as they were. And often if they were feeling tired and they weren't dressed or out of their pyjamas, you saw that. Um, so you saw the deterioration in a different way. I do think that specialist um, oncology teams do do it better because they're more experienced and they work much more in interdisciplinary teams. And so this was at Peter Mac and the surgeons who came across and had that conversation were from the Royal Melbourne. Even though they were from two different hospitals, they were clearly working in a very good communication mechanism. Um, whereas the hospital where my niece had been treated previously, the surgeons were not cancer specialists and didn't have anywhere close to the same sorts of skilled interactions with her um, as they did when we managed to get her moved to the cancer hospital. So in the, in the Australian context, I think we have over-medicalised end-of-life care. We still see the vast majority of people dying in hospitals and in acute environments. And that's often because uh, people haven't normalised death and dying. And so if you ask patients, they might want to stay at home for as long as they can, but they have a lot of fear about dying at home, not necessarily because of their own experience, but for what that will mean for their families. Whereas if we can create a better experience um, and talk about what that might be like, we might make a difference. And I've, I've just recently lost a friend to cancer and his son looked after him at home. And the community palliative care nurses were coming in, but they weren't showing him how to do things. So he hurt his back from kind of lifting his dad and moving him around. Nobody thought to teach him how to sit the person up in bed. Um, and so we're either putting people in acute environments and treating them acutely, or we're leaving them at home 
by themselves and we haven't quite got the balance right um, in terms of how do you really prepare a family for what could be a good experience if you have the right supports around them. So some of the things that I think are really helpful in those communications at the point where a decision for more treatment or not needs to be made is to keep reassurance that this is not abandonment. So being able to ensure that the patient knows that the safety net of the skilled people that have been looking after them, that the relationships that have been developed won't be lost. Um, people often are very concerned about uh, kind of the handover to someone else or a sense of abandonment. It's also really helpful to put the, um, if you like, the options in fairly neutral language, but with an understanding of the kinds of pros and cons of each option. And it's also really important to say that if you make one decision today and it's not working for you, that you can change your mind. So with my um, friend who's just recently died, he was offered chemotherapy. Um, he didn't really want to be sick and, and have um, profound side effects. So the kind of language was, well, we're going, we'll offer you two treatments and then we'll have a review and see if that's working for you and for us. And so that sense that you can move partly down a pathway, but that it doesn't mean the door's closed for a different option is really helpful, I think. So what is a good death and what does it look like is the million dollar question. So I've certainly been involved in many deaths that I would describe as good. The characteristics of those would be that the patient and family were involved and engaged in the decisions that were being made, that there was certainly exquisite attention to symptoms and the things that would be preventing people from living the life that they had left and having people around them who are calm and able to sit and, and be with them, I think, uh, are really important. Whether that can ever be an indicator, I'm not sure, but I think following up with families after a death and having an understanding of their experiences and using that feedback to keep improving is as good a, an indicator as any, I think. COVID-19 was a real jolt, I think, for health professionals from a whole range of perspectives. I think they felt a little bit abandoned by um, the public and by their governments because they were expected to just um, keep on going when in fact they were really struggling with the kinds of things that were confronting them. And from a death and dying perspective, they were things like rules around visiting when people were dying and you know, saying goodbye to somebody on a iPad screen. It, it's really upsetting for the family, but it's also very upsetting for the health professionals that are trying to mediate those conversations. It, I think, showed that there were people who were able to be sacrificed. Some of the language around people in aged care and the, almost as if they were in a waiting room for death anyway and so COVID-19 just kind of made it happen a bit earlier as opposed to understanding that this was still a lot of pain for people where people were coming to nursing homes and looking at family members through the window. I mean it was pretty confronting and when we tried to do some work to say well there should at least be shared decision making about that. Family members might want to take a dying relative home from a nursing home rather than have them die alone but none of those conversations were facilitated. Ambulances were not made available to support that kind of decision and so I think it was it was a profoundly difficult time and it's not gone away. It's still just as difficult in health, frontline health work at the moment. From an Australian perspective the change in government today uh, I hope will reinforce the need to invest in Medicare and to make sure that services are well invested. This real respect for the role that doctors and nurses play in the health system and I hope that will translate 
into the acceptance of advice from key health service leaders. But when you've got a situation where the head of one of the major emergency departments in Melbourne has taken six weeks leave because he's exhausted by COVID and the ability, inability to actually get the system to work for them, there's going to be a lot of repairing that needs to take place. We've lost a lot of health professionals through the pandemic. I'm terrified that people won't be attracted in to the field because it's <clears throat> people have witnessed what health professionals have gone through. So there's a lot of repair that will need to take place. So the health system can learn an awful lot from palliative medicine and, and other health professionals working in end of life care because they will always and do always pay attention to the little things that are often missed in the hurly-burly of acute care. And we're increasingly understanding that the earlier that that engagement occurs in someone's end of life journey, the more likely it is to influence in a positive way. And having, uh, I think it's really around that ability to bring palliative care to the table and to hear the perspectives that are about the person and their choices and the sort of environment within which they would like to die is really an important part of the conversation. So my experience in end of life care has given me a profound respect for each individual's ability to make their own decisions and to create their individual path. And that's, in my leadership roles, led to, I think, an immense respect for patient perspectives um, and consumer involvement. So I've spent a lot of my professional career trying to bring people affected by cancer to the table and, and give them a seat at the table. And that's really come, I think, a lot from those experiences. It's certainly given me a huge respect for the way that multiple disciplines work together. And so advocacy around multidisciplinary teams and the, the ability to hear the multiple voices have been important. From a, a more system leadership perspective, making sure that palliative care is considered an essential component of, of cancer care it, it's interesting because it's written into all of the optimal care pathways for cancer in Australia, but not resourced to be delivered. And so how do you convert some of those commitments into resourcing when it's often the sort of palliative care that's seen as the bit that we can cut if we haven't got enough resources, as opposed to, um, I, I think I've used the analogy before of not thinking about it as the icing on the cake, but the yeast in the bread that makes everything else work well.